Happy Sabbath, church family. Happy Sabbath. So good to see you this morning. Today, we are here to celebrate and to reflect on what Jesus Christ has done for humanity. As we gather around the table, let's remember what he experienced on Mount Calvary. And so with that, I invite you to join me as we pray and ask the Lord guidance upon his word at this time. Father, we are here today simply because of what you mean to us. It's because of the indescribable gift that you have blessed us with. While we're here, the life of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. You have blessed us, Father, uh, with his sacrifice, which provides uh, that reconciliation, uh, Father, that brings us to you and which provides eternity that we can have confidence in. And also, Father, you have blessed us with the power that can transform the sinner. That is all made available to us today all because of what Jesus endured on our behalf. So I just ask, Father, that you would spread your presence around this, this sanctuary. Speak to the heart of every person today. And may as we hear your words, may it become words of life, words of conviction, words of comfort. Father, I give you all that I am. I submit all that I am into your hands to be used by you. All my desire is, Father, is to simply see Jesus be uplifted so that people will be drawn to him. I pray that you'll speak to me and through me. And may as we hear your words today, may we accept them and may we be changed by them. For your name's honor and glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The cross, the cross. Can you hear me clearly? The cross. This week, as I thought about our meeting together, I must have read through Luke 23 <laughs> uh, so many times. I, I just kept reading it. It's 56 verses. But I just kept going over and over and over those verses and, and just absorbing what Jesus actually experienced on that final moment in his life. I would like for you to turn there with me to Luke chapter 23. And I could divide that section of scripture into three parts. And just go through it with you. The gospel of Luke chapter what? 23. What a chapter. The Bible says, then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, we found this fellow perverting the nation. Can you imagine they're speaking to the king of kings and the lord of lords, and we found this fellow.
perverting the nation and forbidding to pay what? Taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is what? In fact, isn't that a lie? Didn't Jesus say, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar? He never went around saying, don't pay taxes. Don't follow these guys, y'all, and don't pay your taxes. Because Jesus didn't pay taxes. Where did they get that from? Can't tell that to the IRS today. They have an auditing team that will come after you. Then Pilate asked him, saying, are you the king of the Jews? He answered him and said, it is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no fault in this man. But they were the more fierce, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. Now, Pilate, when he heard the word Galilee, he was like, whoo, that's my way out. Because you know what? Let's send him to the person that's over Galilee so I can rid myself of this mess. Right? When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, right? He sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Everybody seemed to not want to have nothing to do with Jesus. Some wanted him dead. And some just wanted him at a distance. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad for he had desired for a long time to see him because he had heard many things about him and he hoped to see some miracles done by him. Then he questioned him which, with many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and the scribes stood up, stood and vehemently accused them. They didn't just accuse them, you know. They came at Jesus really hard. Who? Not Herod, not Pilate, but the chief priests, the church. Can you imagine the pastor going full bore against Jesus? I mean, the chief priest should be the one that is what? Promoting Jesus or trying everything he could to save Jesus. But no, the chief priest wanted to see Jesus killed. This was the church at that time who had all the evidence that this man was the Messiah. The chief priest knew it. You know how he knew it? Because in the book of Daniel chapter 9, it told him when Jesus would be crucified. <laughs> they knew exactly when he was supposed to be crucified. Daniel 9 told them. It told them when Jesus was going to be baptized and he told them when Jesus would be slaughtered. They had all the evidence they needed. But yet still, they rejected Jesus and wanted him killed. I'm going to go to verse 13. Then Pilate, when he came together, then Pilate, when he had called together, the chief priests, the rulers, and the people said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misled the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man. Second time. Pilate sent him to Herod, right? Herod sent him back to Pilate. And when Pilate examined Jesus again, based upon all that he was accused of, no fault in this man. Now 
verse 30. I'm going to go to verse 18. So Pilate faced a conundrum, right? And they cried out at once, saying, Away with this man and release to us Barabbas, who has been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion against the city and for murder. So they said to Pilate, you know what? I know you have to release someone today. Guess what? Release the murderer. Set the murderer free. How many people did Jesus kill? None. None. But release Barabbas. But guess what? We have something we want you to do to Jesus. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them. He was begging. <laughs> Can you imagine Pilate begging the Jewish leaders? But they shouted out saying, no, crucify him. Crucify him. Have you ever wondered why they said crucify him? What they were charging Jesus for never required crucifixion. They said he committed the sin of blasphemy. Elder story. Book of Deuteronomy said, listen, sure enough, the punishment for blasphemy is what? Stone him. Really what they should have said was, go ahead and stone him. But they shouted, crucify him. So they were, they were willing to break all the laws, saying that they're a chief priest and there are people who follow God. They disregarded the book because of what was in their hearts. Crucify him. You see, in, in those days with crucifixion, you know, back in the Old Testament, many times when they, when they would f conquer a kingdom, God would tell them, take the king and hang him on a tree. Because he who is hang on a tree, Bible said, is a curse of God. And that simply means that, listen, there's no coming back for such a person. That person is dead and gone and no hope of a resurrection. You see, these, these people thought about it very carefully. Because many times when they talked to Jesus, Jesus would often say to them, if you kill this body, guess what's going to happen on the third day? What's going to happen? It will rise again, right? Well, they thought about it. We need to kill him in such a way where he will never come back from the grave. And the way to do that is to hang him on a what? That's why in Peter, most times when you read the book, the, the letter, um, the epistle of Peter, you see many times Peter will talk about being hang, hung on a tree. They didn't really use the word cross as such. They'll use what they knew about being hung on a tree. And sure enough, when they say crucify him, they were saying, he's never going to come back. And we're going to make sure. Are you with me? And they had it all planned out. They, 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 they wanted to make sure that after he was crucified, that they'll go and roll a stone put in the, uh, and block him in the tomb there and put some guards to guard the place so nobody can steal his body to put Pilate's signet ring there so no one can touch it. They were making sure that Jesus would stay in the tomb and the third day would pass and guess what? It would just be a regular death. Crucify him, they said. But now I want you to see what Jesus went through I want you to see what he went through here. In verse, where was I? Then he said to them in verse 22, the third time, why? What evil 
I say, Dan, I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and just let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one they requested who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison. But he delivered Jesus to their will. Now, as he led him away, as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon of, Cyr of Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. Can you imagine? Brothers was going about his business, right? But I wonder, I wonder if he had some kind of inclination to, or maybe God was speaking to his brother, that this cross he was about to bore was for the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He gladly accepted to bore the cross of Christ. Are you with me? And he was glad to walk that walk of shame with the cross as Jesus was mocked through the street heading to Calvary's hill. I mean, just when you consider someone was there to help Jesus in the worst of times that he ever experienced here on planet Earth. I wonder... I wonder, how does that suit us today, personally? Do you know, do you know that this church, amazing body of people. When I, when I consider the Garland Church, truly, uh, every time I step foot into this church, as I do every, anywhere I serve, I just consider it the greatest privilege I don't come to church just to worship, y'all. I come to church to serve King Jesus. Amen. Are you with me? I come to church because I know that this place is the most treasured possession that he has. He calls it his bride. And so anything I can do to be a blessing to this body... I know that I'm not only blessing you, but you know who I'm blessing? I'm blessing King Jesus. The one who gave his life for me. The one who walked down that street, that narrow street, with people jeering him. I couldn't wait for him to be strung up. Church life should be far more than just showing up on an Easter Sabbath. Are you with me? Church life should be a daily experience lived with Jesus Christ. And maybe someone here today, maybe God has brought you here today to really take an assessment of where you are with your relationship with God. Is it just to receive? does it also include a life of service? Let's, let's, let's bring this closer to Jesus. And the great multitude of the people followed him and women who also mourned and lamented him. But Jesus turned to them and he said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for, weep for yourselves. And for your children. Jesus saw the great anguish that would happen to the Jewish nation not too long after he would die. 
He said, lament for them. Pray that they would, they would accept Jesus as their Messiah. Are you with me? Pray that they would embrace him in their lives and live for him. Because something is about to happen to Jerusalem. He's prophesying what happened to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. He saw it way before. In fact, the same prophecy in the book of Daniel chapter 9 that spoke about when Jesus would die also spoke about the destruction of Jerusalem. That will happen after he died. That's why when you serve Jesus, you know, this is not just someone, this is not just a, a prophet. Because no one can tell the future like Jesus can. Are you with me? He's the only one that can tell the end from the beginning. And he did. And so when the Bible speaks about the Messiah, it's speaking about someone that was prophetically uh, 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 declared and shared to the whole world at the time. That he would come and tell the world, the scriptures told the world when he would come and he showed up the exact time. So this being is definitely who he said he would be. The God-man. The one who was involved in creating this world, this planet. The one who created you. The one who created me. It's a real being. And he's not distant from us. He knows everything that's going on in your world. Everything happening in your home, in your workplace, in the school. He knows what's happening in all of our lives. He's very interested. And you know what? He wants to be our king. There were also two others, two other, two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Then Jesus said, before he died, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. His own people crucified him. And you would think what would fill the heart of Jesus would be so much what? Bitterness. You know, look at them spitting at, spitting at me. I mean, the very people who were blessed by my miracles. <laughs> the very people who, was, who were blessed by my touch, you know, and my ministry. Spitting at me. Jeering me. They took off his clothing. This is God. As he hung there before the people. I mean, they, they did all kinds of, kind of evil against our Lord. And the words that he could only utter to his father, forgive them. Forgive them. I have to say, that I believe with this brother. I really do. Um, when it comes to the cross, what we see is God demonstrating his love. Not for saints. Come on, y'all. But for sinners. 
Is that what the Bible said? God demonstrating his love for sinners. I have a, I, 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 I kind of know what he's speaking of there when Paul speaks about it. Because you know what? Whenever my sons do something that I totally dis, dislike, I have no hatred for them. <laughs> None. Are you with me? I don't like it, you know. And they know I don't like it. But all that's in my heart is just pure love for them. That's it. And that's just a taste. That's a little taste, I believe. When, it, when the Bible said we were made in the image of God, it's just a little taste, I believe, God has in my heart for how he views us. He loves us so much that despite all of the bad, nasty things that we do, Father, forgive them. Because they know not what they do. You know what? I believe that there are things that I do at times that are wrong. I fully know what I was doing. Are you with me? Fully know what I was doing. And even in that, God still loves me. Are you with me? I want you to see he's dying on the cross. And his death was to accomplish, I would say, three things for mankind. And go with me. Go with me to, uh, I'm just going to give three scriptures here and then we'll, we'll transition over to the next part of the service here. But, but just go to Romans 5 with me. That experience he went through that we just read in um, Luke 23, turn to Romans chapter 5. He did all of that to accomplish some things here. Uh, let me see verse 8. Romans 5, verse 8. For God demonstrated his own what? Love, Love towards us in that while we were still what? Sinners. Christ what? Christ. He went through all of that to share with the human race how much he loves us. And how much he does not want sin. All right? To be our end. Are you with me? He wants to prepare a different ending than what sin has in mind for us. And in order to get there, we could not die the death that sin would bring. When sin run to its fullest in the life of the person who never accepted Jesus Christ as a personal savior from sin. The only end that they face is an eternal non-existence. Can I put it that way? An eternal death. No life for eternity. The wages of sin is what? Death. That's, that's what's called in the Bible the second death. Anybody die that death? You're dead. <laughs> Paul said he's dead. Yes, there's no hope of a resurrection after the second death. So someone had to die that for us. Are you with me? In fact, in the book of, in the book of Hebrews, it said Christ, Christ Jesus tasted death for us all. Which death did he taste? The death that none of us should die. The eternal death, the second death. When you see him strung up on the cross, he wanted to demonstrate to humanity, yes, I created you, but I'm willing to exchange my eternal life, all right, so you might have it, and that I might have yours. It's the greatest exchange that took place on the cross. Colossians 1 verse 20, real quick. Colossians 1 verse what? 
Almost there, folks. Almost there. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should what? Dwell. Colossians 1 verse 20. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in what? Heaven, having made peace through the what? Blood of the what? What does the word reconcile mean? When you think about that word. It says he reconciled all things to himself. Reconcile. Bring, bring back. I heard that word. Bring back, right? So something was in a good position at some, some period of time, right? Working very well like my dryer. Oh, I love my dryer. Oh, my goodness. That was the, that was the best dryer we have ever bought. The capacity Huge. You know what I mean? You could fit two washing load in that one dryer. Love it. Until it gave way. Oh, my, my. But guess what? Someone blessed us with another dryer. Hallelujah. You see what I'm saying? So, in other words, now we're good. Joshua was saying to me this week. Dad, thank you for the dry. I said, well, there's somebody else to thank. <laughs> but but just, just check it out. Something was operating really well before, but something went wrong along the way, and now it's time to what? Fix it, right? And reconcile it back together. Well, the truth be told, you know, God is a holy God. Elder Stewart preached a sermon several weeks ago about the holiness of God. You remember that? God is holy, you know. For him to live with sin right now on this planet, all we're operating on right now is pure grace. Pure grace. God is so holy. Actually, I should, let me just follow Ella Stewart's sermon. He is holy, holy, holy. Come on, I'm the only one preacher that was listening to you that day. <laughs> but he's a holy God. Are you with me? And so when you think about this holy God, there's only one thing he can do with sin, y'all, and that is to remove it from his presence. So you remember when, when the children of Israel, when um, they went through the Red Sea and all that, but God had told all of them to put that blood on their blood on their doorposts. If one Israelite did not do that, guess what will happen to him or her? The firstborn would have died in that home. Just like the, the Egyptians. Are you with me? In other words, what God was saving the children of Israel from it wasn't the, 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 the Pharaoh and the Egyptians. He was saving them from himself. <laughs> he was about to destroy sin, right? And they were included too. Every person who would follow him would be spared. But anyone who wouldn't would die. And the truth is that's the greatest salvation. Is God providing a way for humanity to be saved and not experience his wrath against sin? That's what he's after. He wants to save people from his wrath against sin. And if people hear the gospel message that Jesus Christ, the God who created them, gave his life as a ransom for sin, substituted himself in their place and died. And now say, anyone who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And people hear that and turn away from it. Ooh. That is the, 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 the greatest call going out to the world for people to receive God's love and receive All that Christ has done for them. I 
close with this text, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. It says, The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Those who are what? Who are those people who are perishing? It's foolishness to them. Those who are perishing. Who are the perishing? You know, we have a song that we sing called Rescue the Perishing. Care for the? Who are the perishing? The perishing are the, those who hear the gospel and refuse to accept Jesus. But unto us who are being saved, unto us who are what? No, notice it didn't say unto us who have been saved. Come on, y'all. Because salvation is not just a past experience. Come on, y'all. When I gave my, my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, back as a youngster and I accepted his grace in my life, listen, I made that decision so many years ago, right? And I was baptized. Listen, I'm a saved brother. But that doesn't mean that salvation was just past. Because you know what has happened since then? The Lord has been saving me every day. He has been, hey, showing me where I'm going wrong. Things that I need to correct. Are you with me? Every step. I'm being saved. And the day will come when I will be saved. Hallelujah. Amen. The day is coming, you know, when there will be no more sin, no more pain, no more divorce, no more killing. No, you name it. The day will come when all those who accept Jesus Christ as a personal savior from sin will live in an environment of no sin. And you say, Pastor, that is way in the future. But the moment a person dies, that's it for them. The second coming has come for them. Death can happen anytime to any one of us. Are you with me? So the time to make it right with God is now. When we commune around this table, it's heavy stuff. When we drink the blood, we're thinking about Christ's blood being shed on Calvary for me. When we eat the bread, we think about how they bruised him and how his body was broken for us. And he did all of that, endured every part of it. Because he was, th he was thinking about Sean. Are you with me? He was thinking about faith. He was thinking about Ron. I mean, I, I, can we go all the way around the church? Are you willing to stay by? <laughs> but he was thinking about every person. And that's why we gather. If there's someone here today who have never given their heart to Jesus, who have never repented of their sins and asked Jesus to come into their hearts and bring the blessing of forgiveness, the blessings of his power and eternal life. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior from sin, this preacher is opening his arms out wide to you and saying, why not make it today? Why not make it today? Maybe you've been on this journey, but you see where there are areas of your Christianity, your relationship with Jesus, that sure do need some work. You do see the need to have more of Jesus in your life and to have him 
bless you with his forgiveness and to help you through the struggles of your daily life. You might be here today and say, you know, Pastor, I need that. I truly do need a closer walk with Jesus. I really do. I'm going to stand first for you. But wherever you see yourself this, this afternoon, and you just want to stand before Jesus and say, Jesus, based upon those two calls made, I'm standing in reference to one of them. Either I'm giving my life completely new to you, or I'm declaring before you today in this church that I need you more than ever. I'm inviting you to stand today in the presence of the Holy God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Our Father, uh, I stand with your people today. In thanksgiving first for your word. It's the word that you have blessed us with that shares the experiences that Jesus went through while he was here. How much he suffered and how much he willingly gave his life so that we, his children, could find hope living in a land of sin so that we his children could experience a new beginning there are people who are standing here today you know them father they're standing here today saying I want to be born again. I want to receive Jesus as my personal Savior from sin. And I want to experience all that he suffered for and died for so that I could possess. I pray, Father, for those people that you would, you would continue to, to work in their hearts in such a way where you will move them to that point where they will step forward and say, Pastor, I would like to be baptized. The Bible said, if you believe and are baptized, you shall be saved. I believe. I want to take the next step. Work on them, Father. Move them to that spot so that their eternal kingdom can be realized. Uh, Father, I, I, I want to thank you for all those who have been journeying through this life with you. We recognize that there's so much more that we desire to be when we look at you. When we think about Jesus and his character and we think about our lives at times, we do see areas of growth needed. I just ask in the name of Jesus that you would not pass anyone by, but you would stop by each person today and deliver your presence in all of our hearts and help us on this journey so we can remain faithful and remain strong, obedient, and be of service to you. Help us to, to live a life not as a fan, but as a follower. Not as someone who just hears your word, but people who do your word. Help us to be authentic in all that we do and to be your ambassadors here on planet earth as we wait for the return of your son, Jesus Christ. 
We ask now for your blessing as we enter into the communion, the gathering around your table. Be with us now, we pray. In the name of Jesus, the church of the living God, say, Amen, amen and Amen.